It's good to be here. So I figure it's probably a geeky minister thing for me to say this, but I've really had a, a fun time with the celebrations of, of Advent these past four weeks. We started early at friends' homes, despite the fact that I've had to do each one twice because we have two locations. <laughs> the final candle of Advent the Christ light around which all the other candles are circled is the one that remains to be lit this coming week. I have found that Advent offers such a rich framework around the season leading up to Christmas. And uh, I'm, I'm still curious about a couple of rabbit holes that I want to go down. And so I'll take you down one today, if you don't mind coming with me. I promise we have a way out, though. No, no uh, bottles to be drank or anything. <laughs> so just a little backstory is that the history of Advent itself, just Advent, was a, a Christian practice that is said to have started around the year 571 CE as a way to keep the French monks on their 30-day fast, which I probably would need some kind of tool to, uh, to go more than a day or two without foods a lot, but to fast throughout the month of December was where the practice of Advent was begun. It wasn't until the late 1500s that the Advent wreath became an adopted custom by the German Lutherans, and I've talked about that being a way, way old custom, way predating Christianity. So the 1500s, the Germans decided to adopt it and apply it to Advent, but it took another 400 years. It wasn't until the 1920s and 1930s that the custom of Advent and the Advent wreath actually made its way around the world, including the United States. So it's not even a hundred year old practice here. The four candles around the majority of Christian Advent wreaths, there are wreaths that, that contain more candles. They represent the central elements related to the arrival of this person, this baby Jesus. There's a candle for hope, a candle for joy and love, and another for peace. And having considered in depth these four attributes, I'm thinking there should be at least one, if not two more candles, if we want to have the complete picture of what Christmas and the Christ light brings to life and to each one of us. The first candle I'd add to the Advent wreath is all your fault. <laughs> it's the candle of community. I got to thinking about what a wonderful community Winston-Salem Friends Meeting is. Even with contentions and differences, there, there's just such community here. And I think that maybe that that deserves its own candle. And maybe it should be the first candle lit in the beginning of Advent because it starts right on the hills of Thanksgiving, which is a very communal holiday. And the four remaining Christmas gifts, love, hope, joy, and peace, couldn't thrive unless they're nurtured in the soil of community. Even the Christmas story itself unfolds out of many layers of community. So we've all heard and probably even shared the gospel stories surrounding Jesus' birth, that Mary and Joseph were totally alone, they'd been turned away from the crowded ends, and forced to bring their son into the, world, into the world in a lonely, dank lean-to of a barn. 
with just a bunch of animals staring at them. The word traveled fast throughout the region with angelic heralds and a bright star that led the way to the baby. But academic experts, scholars in ancient history and scholars in the languages of the earliest written scriptures that are available to us have long proposed that Mary and Joseph weren't actually turned away from a public inn. The word in ancient Greek of all the, in all the texts for the place that they had been seeking shelter is kataluma. Kataluma is the upper part of a private two-level home in which generations of humans live together in a very small space. The animals, however, were housed in the lower section because it was easier for them to come and go throughout the day and you brought them in at, in at night so that they wouldn't be eaten or lost. Or stolen. Or stolen. It's quite likely that Mary and Joseph were greeted warmly by Joseph's extended family since they were returning to his homeland because of the census decree. Being from the lineage of David, even strangers would have taken Joseph and his very pregnant wife in. That kind of ancestry would have made David kind of a local celebrity, if you will. They would have been duty-bound and honored to host the couple because of David's, the lineage of David that Joseph came from. But the Cataluma where Joseph and Mary had sought shelter was likely very crowded because all his other relatives had arrived ahead of them for the exact same reason that they were there. It was probably so full that there was no room for Mary to give birth amid the noisy, crowded tribe that had gathered. No privacy, no corner in which they might find seclusion. In fact, privacy and quiet was so rare that an ancient uh, writer from that era wrote that if he wanted to find stillness, he had to go out beyond the city into the hills. So there was no room for Mary and Joseph upstairs with the humans. So they went down to the lower room where the animals had been brought in for the night. There would have been ample clean hay that would have served as a birthing bed for Mary and a warm place to lay the ba newborn baby. There was quiet, maybe, but certainly not loneliness in the lower room. And I don't think it's a mistake that there's an emphasis on Jesus being born with the animals in the lower room while the feasting with his disciples before his death took place in the upper room. Something for future consideration. The story of Jesus' birth continues just the way it began, with people from all over encircling the Christ child. I even imagine the women of Joseph's family coming down once the baby is born or perhaps helping while the baby was being born. Already the shepherds had received the heralded news of the baby's birth in Bethlehem. Shepherds who were considered the lowliest of low in the Jewish culture of Jesus' time. They could not practice the cleanliness requirements of their beliefs nor could they go to the Sabbath gatherings. So they were the lowliest of low, and they were the first to receive the news. And well before that, before Gabriel had trumpeted the arrival 
of baby Jesus to the shepherds. He'd already appeared to Mary to share with her the news of her pregnancy. And another angel had visited Joseph in a dream to reassure him and to pave the way for Jesus' birth. The community already surrounding Jesus from the very beginning consisted of the lowliest of low, the holiest of holy, and the familiarity of family. As Jesus grew up, we find him visited by wise men from differing regions, bearing gifts suited for a royal recipient. Jesus' community had expanded beyond boundaries and borders to include strangers from foreign lands when he was barely toddling. And as he grew up, Jesus could be found seated among his community in the Jewish temple. He was at a wedding later. And at the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus sought out community by recruiting a diverse group of disciples to help him nearly every step of the way to the cross and beyond. Fishermen and net menders who could barely scrape out a living. A wealthy and well-educated tax collector who liked to party. A political revolutionary. Jesus had pulled together quite a diverse team for supporting his ministry. Rarely do we read of Jesus being alone except in a garden or in a boat to pray or in the desert to strengthen his faith and his commitment to the work he was cut out for. And more often than not, when he was alone, his community was just a little bit away. Even today, community continues to be a vital part of the light of Christ, the hope, the love, the joy, and peace. In community, sometimes we're the candle that has to shine the light of Christ, kind of like the Advent candles. And other times, we need the light shining from other people to help us keep our own light aglow. Community is a place where we can grieve and heal. It's a place where we can give and forgive and be reconciled. We can reassure each other, I got you. When someone is burdened with difficulties and worries, without community, I think our joys and our healing would be muted. If we were as lonely as Mary and Joseph were said to have been when Jesus was born, our own trials and our sorrows would nearly be unbearable. Advent teaches us that the most meaningful journeys are those shared within a community where the warmth of companionship lights the path ahead even if it's a faltering path or a, um, a community that means well but often doesn't do well. At least it's a gathered community. From the very beginning, the story of Jesus' birth is a repeated invitation into community. Throughout the Christian scriptures, we read about the wide cast of characters that were drawn into community by the Christ light. It was this diverse group of people who sustained and carried that light out into the world after Jesus' ascension. Most of us are familiar with that Greek word used for that kind of community, koinonia, which is the spiritual fellowship that tends to each other's needs within the community as well as the needs of those 
outside of the community. Living the light of Christmas within community means that we try our very best to leave people better than we found them. We can hug the hurt, comfort the broken, accompany the lost, and connect with the lonely, and at the very least, we can speak gently and act kindly. So as we celebrate the birth of Jesus and the community into which he was born and supported, may this community continue to serve as a beacon of hope and joy, love and peace a koinonia, supporting each other through the challenges of life toward the light of Christ. Amen.